Once again, we have reason to remark at the amazing providence of God that we should have these events in worship today and come to this text today. Only the Lord and his divine providence could arrange these things. Gospel of Matthew, please, we go to that gospel and to the 18th chapter. We're turning the page from the 17th to the 18th finally, and we'll pick up at verse 1 and read the first six verses. I should inform you, I think, that we are now coming to the so-called fourth book of Matthew's collected teachings of Jesus. Remember, the tidy-minded uh, author Matthew organized his gospel in alternating sections of narrative and teaching. We've just completed a narrative section at the, uh, in chapter 17, and we begin another teaching section now that extends through Chapter 18, verse, uh, th from 18, verse 1, rather, through 19, verse 1, and then we'll end with that typical formula we've heard before that Matthew uses to conclude each of these sections in his gospel. In this section of, of Matthew, Jesus will present to us the character of the community, of the covenant community that he is creating, the church. How different, how vastly different the values of the kingdom of heaven are from the patterns of the world. Indeed, they're exactly the opposite, as the disciples found out, and as we're about to be reminded with them. Cleaning up uh, piles of paper in my study that have accumulated uh, for some time, a few days ago, I came to a CD in a jewel case on which were written the words, How Then Shall We Live? Well, that's exactly the right question that Jesus addresses today in answer to the exactly wrong question <laughs> that the disciples asked him that day in Capernaum. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and Thank you that you've preserved it to this day for us to hear and to receive into the inmost parts of our hearts, that our lives may be conformed to it. So we pray, Father, that your Spirit will continue his mighty work in this worship, now in this way, illumining our hearts, molding and shaping them, that we may be what our Savior has died and given his life on the cross and risen from the dead for us to be little children. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 18, beginning at verse 1. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. Mark tells us in his gospel that shortly before this teaching from Jesus, the disciples had been disputing among themselves on their walk to Capernaum about which one of them was the greatest. Luke tells us in his gospel that they were arguing. How ironic, isn't it, that Jesus had just told them about his impending death and resurrection from the dead, and here they're arguing about their place, about their own importance in the kingdom. This was a preoccupation with them, we know, because they will be back to disputing this again, as if you can believe it or not, as late as the upper room, immediately after Jesus had just had the Lord's Supper or Last Supper, whatever you want to call it, it just told them of his impending death. 
And they turn around and start arguing again. Well, who's the greatest? You or me? Now, their repeated arguments over their relative greatness so soon after Jesus' grim news is certainly the demonstration of their total misunderstanding of the nature of Jesus' ministry and of his mission and what it meant for them. As one commentator puts it, the very fact that they asked that question showed that they had no idea at all what the kingdom of heaven was. Just so, Luke pitifully reports that they did not understand what this meant. They had some sense, didn't they? They had some sense based on what, was a, what they were hearing from Jesus that something was about to happen. You know, something was afoot. The kingdom was soon to be established. The Messiah is on the move. And like all people who find themselves standing next to greatness at the side of someone who is about to be king, they strive for the position of prime minister. We can be confident as they were arguing and offering nominations between themselves. It was not Peter nominating John (laughs) as the greatest and John bashfully demurring and saying, oh no, gentlemen, Andrew's Andrew's your man. And then Andrew's saying, oh please, gentlemen, I, I, I think Philip would do a much better job. That's not what was happening here. Each one is jockeying for position. They're arguing. Can't you imagine Peter presenting himself as the one who had I walked on water. You remember that? You saw it with your own eyes. Jesus called me the rock. You know, Jesus had miraculously paid. You remember, it's just yesterday, he says, earlier today, maybe, Jesus just paid my taxes miraculously. To say nothing of the fact that Peter has in mind that he'd just seen the transfiguration, too. In fact, had not the temple tax collectors come to Peter... Wasn't that confirmation that he was the leader among the disciples, you know? At least in his own mind. Then, then John disagrees with Peter. He, he accuses Peter of, Peter, you are on some sort of ego trip, man. I'm the disciple that Jesus loves. And on and on it goes. Jesus discovers their argument. And so they ask him, Jesus, tell us, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And they wait with bated breath for the answer. It's going to be me. I just know it's going to be me. (laughs) But the answer doesn't come. Instead, Jesus looks around. He looks for a little child. Come here. And of course, children love Jesus. And for good reason, a child comes over and he puts the little child in the middle of them all and then and I imagine him even dandling the child on his loving knee. And he, and he rocks the disciples' world. And he says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And in an instant, their faces change from anticipation to confusion. Wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> Is Jesus saying we're not even in the kingdom? Is that what he's saying? And... and become like little children what is that all about what does that mean what does it mean we do we have to become stupid <laughs> uh, do we do we have to become ignorant recently read the the words painted on the uh, on the on the back of a truck sleeper that said this school is important but trucking is importanter <laughs> you know, is that what Jesus is after? Does he want us to get dumb, you know, or, or be easily amused or gullible or, or maybe really good at throwing temper tantrums or getting in the way? Children were not viewed very highly in Jesus' day. If by becoming like little children, Jesus meant they should become childish, <laughs> well, they've got that one down pat, don't they? My word, they've been proving it just by this argument. Like Cassius Clay's childish line, they all knew, they just knew, I am the greatest. But, you know, lest we too quickly look down our noses at the disciples. 
we immediately remind ourselves, don't we, that, that this same argument continues to rage. Where? In your heart. In your heart and in mine. In the secret places of our hearts. You know the jealousy of which I speak, don't you? For pride of place, for power, for prestige, for the admiration of people. And you know the imaginary justifications you give yourself for your, for your jealous thinking. But back to the point. What does Jesus mean by becoming like children? Well, so as to make it perfectly here, it, clear, he explains to them and to us here in verse 4, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus is helping us to understand here, isn't he, by drawing this child to himself, this person who is socially insignificant, often overlooked, too easily unappreciated, that this is what he wants us to be. He wants, us, he wants his disciples to be like little children. In fact, to be his disciple at all. If you want to go to heaven, you have to be changed into a little child in this way. What he means is that he wants for us to see ourselves after the manner of a child in adult society. Small, insignificant. Little. Little in our own eyes, in our own estimation of ourselves. In a word, humble. Humility is the prerequisite for entering the kingdom of heaven. And it is the condition for continuing in the kingdom of heaven. People who are busy pursuing their own achievements, trying to draw attention to themselves, pushing themselves always into other people's field of vision. They're not even able to enter the kingdom of God or, or serve it. And a faithful follower of Jesus does not ask or imagine that she might be, that he might be the greatest. They do not look down on fellow Christians because they see themselves for what they are as little children always looking up. It's that kind of humility that fits us for service in the kingdom of God. It thinks of self as little or, or better, better yet, doesn't think of self at all. It's willing even to be invisible like this little, little child Surrounded by these grown men until Jesus brings the child into their circle. And even in their circle, that child must have seemed surrounded by these men, small, insignificant. You know, the greatest Christians in the kingdom have always known this. And they've always practiced it. Desire to be unknown. That's what the great medieval... A writer, uh, Thomas Akempis, wrote to the readers of The Imitation of Christ, Desire to be Unknown. Jerry Taylor, the Anglican writer of the spiritual classics, Holy Living and Holy Dying, prayed, Oh, teach me to love to be concealed. Be ambitious to be unknown, adds another saint. Speaking to his disciples, Jesus is calling us to a radical kind of thinking here, isn't he? A total, total reorientation of thinking from the thinking that prevails in the world. You know, corporate America is all about status, it's about advancement, it's about climbing the ladder, it's about rising to greatness. The church of Jesus Christ is all about the opposite 
It's about lowering ourselves, descending to greatness. This, by the way, is also perfectly in tune, isn't it, with what Jesus has just announced. The Son of Man is going to be handed into, placed in the hands, delivered into the hands of men. And what he has just done, paying the temple tax from which he was utterly exempt as the Son of Man. He is turning to us and he's saying, you, you're like little children, dependent and insignificant. And when you know that and you understand that and you grasp that, then you understand that I have loved you. I have chosen you. I have come into the world and given myself utterly in life and in death for you, little children, even little people like you. And now you must do the same, he says, for them, for those other little ones for whom I have humbled myself, made myself their servant. Now you become their servant too. When a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, gets hold of this and truly thinks of himself or herself as a little child, precious to God and loved by Him, then he or she will be able to adopt this spirit of self-forgetfulness that moved Jesus to, to give up His rightful place in order... Remember, He became a little child, helpless in the manger, and then walked around as a little child. I say to give up His rightful place in order to save us from our sins and that person will turn and treat others the, the, the way that the Lord is telling us to. With mercy, with sympathy. Now think about this. If the living God, if you can wrap your mind around this, and of course you won't completely, the living God humbles himself, becomes nothing, takes the form of a Servant humbles himself even to death, even death on the cross. Humbled himself this way for a nothing like you. I don't mean to insult you. I mean to tell you the way it is. For a nothing like me, for a nothing like you, the living God humbled himself, then how can you, how can we possibly think less of others than we should or more of ourselves than we ought. The story has been repeated of a visit by a very famous British pastor, theologian and author to an island called Fair Isle, a bird sanctuary in the north of Scotland. There are apparently lots of bird lovers in Britain. They, they love to watch the various gorgeous birds, the puffins in particular on Fair Isle. And they're beautiful birds. And this famous British pastor was a true bird watcher. He loved, this pastor did to watch the birds. He would take vacations and go watch the birds. Well, he went to Fair Isle, and the, the man who was operating a particular shop there on Fair Isle was an evangelical Christian himself. And he thought that he recognized the man who walked into the shop, and so he began to ask him questions. Uh, well, where, sir, where are you from? I'd have to bring Connor up here to get the accent right. I'm not even going to try it. But, uh, uh, well, I'm from London. Well, what do you do? I'm a preacher. And he pressed him, and he pressed him, and he pressed him, and, and he couldn't get any more information out of this man than, than I'm a preacher. Well, the man left the aisle and went to the mainland to continue his vacation there, and the shop owner looked in his uh, registration book for the name that was signed there, and this was it. John R. W. Stott. The great 
Anglican Evangelical Minister of All Souls Church in London had been there on Fair Isle and quietly avoided the potential accolades, even of a fellow Christian and probably one of his readers. The humility of, of this man was evident to all. It's now even more so on retrospect since his passage in the glory. That's the kind of greatness to which Jesus is calling us. The greatness that comes from being unknown. Thomas Akempis, again, he is genuinely great who considers himself small and cares nothing for high honors. Great people never know that they're great, do they? But small people somehow never quite know that they're small. As I was preparing this message, I, I took a break for lunch. I jumped in the car to go grab a couple of tacos for Debbie and me. And driving down the road on my way to Taco Bell, I saw a familiar sight. A man I have known and respected for the better part of the last three decades. I knew it was he because he was driving the opposite direction in the car he's been driving for the better part of the last two decades. He is a brilliant man, greatly talented, in my opinion, a godly man, in the opinion of those who know him. And this congregation has greatly and directly benefited from his loving service, though most of you don't even know his name. Years ago, I called uh, Kentucky Public Television Network, uh, asking them to feature this man's skillful work in one of their Kentucky Spotlight programs. I'm still waiting for the call back. Uh, but there he was, on his way, no doubt, to care for one ailing person or another, which is his habit. He is wont to do this, unknown, invisible to everyone around him. I, I just had to thank the Lord on the spot for supplying me that living illustration of what he's showing us today. True greatness. Kingdom greatness. Greatness that holds God's eye. Greatness that enjoys God's smile. His blessing had just passed me by right out here on Route 54. I told you about John Stott, famous yet unknown on Fair Isle. Well, among his many books, John Stott wrote one entitled The Incomparable Christ. And in it, he tells the story of Dr. Thomas Barnardo, not, alas, Barnardo, but Barnardo, who lived from 1845 to 1905. Now listen to this. Becoming a Christian at 17 years of age and inspired by Hudson Taylor, he entered medical school in London with the intention of going to China as a doctor and missionary. But within a few months of the beginning of his medical studies, his carefully laid plans for China were overturned by his discovery of the pitiable existence of so many children on London's East End, so many street children. In 1870, at the age of 25, he opened his first home for them. He was to remain in London and devote the rest of his life to their care, as he put it, to the care of the most helpless and needy of all God's creatures, the destitute child. Over the next 40 years, he raised enormous amounts of, of money and established a network of homes for the care and the training of these boys and girls. He rescued some 60,000 children from destitution. Barnardo's uh, dedication to these orphaned and destitute children had a dramatic beginning. Among the street boys he met was one John Summers, age 11. He was known as Carrots, and you could probably imagine why, because of his red hair. 
This boy, like so many others, slept out in the cold on, on cold and wet London nights. On one of his first late night forays to find and, and care for these children, Barnardo gathered five boys to take home with him for the night. Carrots begged to be included, but uh, Barnardo told him he had no more room, but would give him the first spot the next time. A few mornings later, next to a warehouse, a workman rolled away from the wall a large empty sugar barrel. And in doing so, he disturbed a sleeping boy who awoke and immediately jumped up and made his escape. And lying next to that boy was another boy who was thought also to be asleep, but was discovered to be dead. And the boy was carrots. And the coroner pronounced the death due to exhaustion, exposure, and malnutrition. Well, this tragedy burned itself into Thomas Barnardo's soul. Never again, he said. And outside his home for street children, he posted a prominent sign that read, No destitute child ever refused admission. And he later added the words, An ever open door. Later, Barnardo was able to make this claim. We receive children whom no other charitable institution will touch. Children in the last stage of lingering disease. Children who are lame, halt, and blind. Children who, as a result of a long course of neglect and suffering, can be admitted only to die. The one condition of eligibility is destitution. When Barnardo died, some 1,500 boys attended his funeral. At the time, more than 8,000 were living in his homes, and many thousands more had been settled in private homes. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why, why would he take on such a thankless task and, uh, and lowly? caring for the very least significant of people. Well, simply this. Barnardo was a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in welcoming and receiving these, as Jesus says in verse 5, he was receiving Christ. He was receiving Christ himself. Now, I know some of you are, are thinking to yourselves, well, Jesus was not talking about children per se. He was rather talking about his disciples under the image of children and fellow Christians as little ones. But to, still, he did take an actual child, didn't he? A and put that child in front of his disciples. A and we've seen him specifically loving children before, haven't we? We, are, we heard just this morning at at the baptism, how he gathered children to himself, put, gathered them in his arms and, and blessed them. And if you look closely at these biblical interactions between Jesus and children, you will see yourself. Won't you? Don't you? You see yourself weak, Helpless, little, as you truly are. And you will see why it is that Christians care for children. Because in doing so, we're really just living out our own salvation. Just this past Wednesday, we lifted up in prayer meeting again the work of our own denominational missionaries worldwide and deliberately and specifically, we call it a mission street child, bringing care to thousands and thousands of street children in those places where we're bringing the gospel. We can't help it. We're trying, even if imperfectly, to do for others 
what Jesus has done for us. It's not so much because children are so worthy you know, of our care. You know, even Barnardo had to deal with some real pests. You know he did. But looking on those children, we see ourselves. And loving them, we pass along the love with which we, spiritual street children ourselves, small, destitute, filthy, rebellious, unworthy, lost, the least of society, have been loved nonetheless and brought home by Christ. Amen.